Mary Mitchley's book on evolution is called Evolution as a Religion, Strange Hopes and Stranger Fears. And it was published in 1985 in the aftermath of her now famous run-in with Richard Dawkins on the selfish gene back in 1979. And it's worth remarking here that took place in the pages of philosophy. Uh, Mary's article, Gene Juggling, was in 1979, as I just said. Dawkins replied in defence of selfish genes in 1981, and there was a further reply from Mary Midgley, Selfish Genes and Social Darwinism, in 1983. Mary later admitted to being intemperate in her original foray into gene juggling, but intemperately expressed or not, her point about talk about selfish genes involving a host of category mistakes is surely destructive of Dawkins' position, undermining the basic stance of his book, which, of course, as you know, is called The Selfish Gene. All to the good, one might think, given that Dawkins' view involved damaging misconceptions about human agency, we are prisoners of our genes, or machines created by genes, about life itself, a form of unbridled competition directed by unconscious strings of cellular matter, genes or DNA, single genes actually manipulating our conscious thought and motivations for their own ends, and about society and morality, in which we are born selfish and altruism morphs into reciprocal altruism, a euphemism for Hobbesian prudential bargaining. While Mary may have been intemperate in 1979, Dawkins and his views, including his later views on religion and on memes, ideological analogues of genes, which apparently colonise living human minds in much the same way that genes, abstract entities as far as I can see, colonise living tissue, have gone from strength to strength in public consciousness and in influence. Mary, maybe Mary in 1979 wasn't intemperate enough because what she did then did little to stem the apparently unstoppable Dawkins surge. Or maybe she did not get the support she should have received from her philosophical and academic colleagues, no doubt unwilling to back her, a then little-known philosophy lecturer from Newcastle against an eminent and fashionable Oxford scientist. The 1985 book, e Evolution, as a religion, does take up the earlier opposition to Dawkins, but it has a much larger agenda, as is suggested in the title. It attempts to analyse and criticise the way that the theory of evolution has, for many of its admirers, taken on a quasi-religious dimension. It has, for example, been used to develop a faith in the emergence of a kind of superman, and she does talk about man all the time, actually, maybe she has making a point there, what she calls Omega Man, which is a reference to Teilhard de Chardin's um, Omega Point, I think, um, and his world, under the direction of the scientists of the future who will bring this result about by genetic engineering and the development of artificial intelligence. Such figures as the biologist William Day, the geneticist J.H. Miller, and the Marxist physicist J.D. Bernal are given as examples of this type of thinking, in Bernal's case, leading to a new world in which scientists would, quote, this is Bernal, emerge as a new species and leave humanity behind. Scientists. It cannot, of course, be said that tendencies of this sort have in any way declined since 1985. Almost every day we hear yet another claim about a singularity, shortly to be upon us, in which artificial intelligence will supersede natural intelligence, or yet more extravagant claims about the potential genetic engineering has to rewrite human nature. If anything, the critique offered by evolution as a religion is more relevant now than it was when it appeared. And it's interesting to note that in her recent book, What is, what is Philosophy For?, which has just come out in fact, Mary spends a good deal of space challenging the efforts of such luminaries as Ray Kurzweil and Lord Rees to depict a future in which we will be dominated and manipulated by super-advanced or hyper-computers, 
in Rees's case, apparently even merging with them in a future in which we will not be able to switch the machines off or challenge their awesome powers of intelligence. All this, according to Mary, is at best a fable. Though a fable still flourishing, as I've just suggested, it even more in 2018 than it was in the last century, at least among the semi-educated. Lord Rees is making much the same points in his On the Future, a book that's just come out, a book clearly directed at the at general reader, which appeared only a few weeks ago, and in his Brief Answers to Big Questions, also just out, the late Stephen Hawking had similar things to say about a race of, quote, self-designing beings morphing into hopefully benevolent, immortal, digital surrogates of us or we humans. According to Midgley, fables of this sort, with their focus on AI, artificial intelligence, sorry, artificial generated machine intelligence, misunderstand the multifarious nature of human intelligence and rely on completely improbable and untestable predictions and about which their proponents seem strangely complacent that were their fables true, they would be making themselves redundant. Apart from the point about human intelligence being highly protean, varied and context specific, Mary also points out that many aspects of human experience, intelligence of a practical sort, including of course Aristotelian phrenesis, which is by definition unformalizable, are involved in intelligent decision making, aspects which have in no serious way been or probably could be replicated in AI. She also makes the very Midgley-esque observation that unlike science fiction writers delving into such imaginary futures, Kurzweil, Rees and company woefully underdescribe the situations they are envisaging or their implications for life and practice. In other words, they may be fabulists, but they're bad fabulists, or bad fiction writers. And she might also have mentioned Karl Popper's master argument in The Poverty of Historicism about the impossibility of predicting the course of technological development. Because if we could predict it with any degree of decision, precision, sorry, we would be able to do it now. And who, even 10 years ago, could have predicted the current extraordinary proliferation of uses and abuses of the internet? In her initial criticism of the extravagance of evolutionary and AI utopians, what she calls the Omega Men, Mary is anxious to dissociate Darwin himself entirely from any taint or influence. She tells us that Darwin detested the very name evolution and denied that his theory carried with it, in her words, any innate tendency to progressive development. Her book is indeed dedicated to the memory of Charles Darwin, who did not say these things. And much of her own animus in the book is against the way that, in her opinion, Darwin's theory has been co-opted by thinkers such as Spencer and Galton into a full-blooded apologia for the merits of unbridled competition. At this point, we need to be careful. Darwin did not say some, or even many, of the things Midgley is objecting to. But when we come to matters to do with what has come to be known as social Darwinism and the concept of evolution itself, things are somewhat less clear. Part of the problem here is that Darwin himself is ambivalent on the progressive significance of his theory, and different commentators stress different aspects here. Thus, in line with Stephen Jay Gould, Midgley herself emphasises the modest interpretation of evolution, or rather, as Darwin preferred, descent with modification. She points out that he thought that the idea of a linear progressive evolution was vacuous. Evolution was by no means unidirectional, but rather more like the de development of a humble bush, in her terms, a rich radiation of varying forms in which human qualities cannot, any more than others, determine a general direction for the whole. Midgley takes this Darwinian picture to stand in strong, strong contrast to what she calls melodramas, like the social Darwinist or Spencerian one, which became so influential in the years following the publication of The Origin of Species and in various mutant forms on into our own day, as her book 
illustrates. One can indeed reinforce Midgley's general point here. In origin, Darwin appears reluctant to use the term evolution, preferring the more neutral descent with modification, as I've just mentioned, and formally speaking, he is correct to do so. For what the theory of natural selection says is that in the struggle for existence, better equipped competitors will outbreed and replace less well-equipped ones. This replacement strategy does not require progress in any sense other than that of surviving better and reproducing more. As Darwin himself points out, this is actually consistent with losing capacities and even organs which are costly but which provide no selective advantage. Flightlessness in birds, unthreatened by rodents, loss of sight in cave-dwelling creatures. Of course, the flightless birds existed for millennia, thousands of millennia in New Zealand until um, the Maoris came in about 1100 AD. Um, and then, of course, they brought with them rodents that by the time Captain Cook came, the flightless birds were nearly all extinct. But for ages, um, these flightless birds had survived very well. They lost the power of flight, which was costly, and, and they got on perfectly well. The basic point is, it, is that in the absence of certain types of threat, it will actually be disadvantageous to develop along particular lines, costly in terms of the need for nutrition or disproportionately heavy limbs or organs, for example, even if from some other point of view, ours perhaps, those lines might seem superior. But that is not the point of view of Darwin or implicit in his theory. Or so it might seem, so long as we stick to the main text of Origin and overlook its last three paragraphs. The third last paragraph is short and enigmatic. In the distant future, I see open fields for far more important researchers. Psychology will be based on a new foundation, that of the necessary acquirement of each mental power and capacity by gradation. Light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history. Darwin. Objectionable as Day, Muller, Bernal and their associates, the Omega men, might be, in the light of Darwin's talk of a distant future and of the necessary acquirement of each mental power and capacity, it would be unfair to accuse them of being wholly un-Darwinian. Social Darwinism I will return to, but for now I just note the sentence I've emphasised about light being thrown on man and his history. Man, I'm using Darwin's terms of course all the time, Man, as a species, is not mentioned in origin before this point, for the third last paragraph, but he is clearly lurking in the background. He or we are clearly lurking in the background, or perhaps rather more than that, as emerged in the ensuing controversies. Everyone knew that evolution or descent with modification would have huge implications for our thinking about ourselves, implications spelt out, as we will see, in The Descent of Man, Darwin's later book, to which I regret that Mary paid scant attention in evolution as a religion. To return to origin, the penultimate paragraph concludes, and as natural selection works solely by and for the good of each being, all corporeal and mental endowments will tend to progress towards perfection, perfection, which is hardly a modest claim about a humble bush branching out in indefinite and random directions. And in case we were still thinking that Darwin's view encompasses a, mod a modest agnosticism regarding perfection, I will simply quote Origen's concluding two sentences. Thus, he says, from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of the higher, note higher, animals directly follows. There is a grandeur in the view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that whilst this planet has gone on cycling according to the fixed law of gravity, that from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being, guess what the next word is? Evolved. Evolved. <laughs> 
Apart from the point that all these wonderful results follow from a ceaseless war of nature, competition, it is significant that the very last word in the book is evolved. Whatever Darwin's own linguistic and theoretical austerity in the body of his text, there can be no doubt that he saw himself as propounding not just a theory of evolution, but also one charged with progressivist implications, which he himself took to follow from the theory. Indeed, Darwin's own position here is, as I've just suggested, at the very least a mild version of the escalator view which Midgley attacks in her book. That is the view that she dubs the irresistible escalator, the notion that evolution is set on a road that leads to inevitable and continuous improvement. And that this road encompasses us humans too is made clear by Darwin himself when he wrote in a letter to Lyell in 1860, that's one year after Origin was published, that he hoped that there would come a time when through generations of moral and intellectual training, human beings would come to look at the thought of his time, including his own and Lyle's presumably, as that of mere barbarians. I can't go into the epistemological implications of this thought here, save to remark that to his credit, Darwin was clearly anticipating the pessimistic meta-induction of contemporary philosophy of science by a century and a half. That's, the, that's that every scientific theory that's ever come up has been proved false. So why should we think that today's scientific theories won't be proved false? That's the pessimistic meta-induction with which Karl Popper would have had some sympathy. Do we in fact detect a slight ambivalence on this point in Midgley herself? For wanting to dissociate Darwin from the futurism of the Omega men in her last book, What is Philosophy For? Mary is keen to emphasise that Darwinism involves cooperation between and within species and also within whole organisms as part of evolutionary development. So it's not simply a matter of selfish genes competing ruthlessly at an atomistic level. But over and above that, following biologists such as Simon Conway Morris, she argues that there is a convergence in evolution, convergence, with drifts within different species to such capacities as increased awareness and towards what Conway Morris refers to as islands of, nice phrase, biological habitability. The classic case being the separate development of the eye in a number of different species. Against austere descent with modification, we can then see in evolutionary development a directedness of sorts, providing we don't interpret this as progress to a single overarching goal. We can, on occasion, ask, this is Mary's words, which way of life, sorry, which way of living is life aiming at here? We can speak of increased awareness as being important and valuable for living creatures and so highly probable in evolutionary development. Darwinian qualifications and even concessions to a degree of directedness and evolution do not, of course, imply, though, that Darwin would have had any truck with the futuristic people Mary singles out. Darwin does not say anything specific enough on the broad picture of progressive evolutionary development, and unlike the authors she singles out for attack in her book, he may well have been suitably cautious about predicting in any detail the future course of evolutionary development. But despite the impression given by Mary, Darwin does say quite a lot, in some detail, on the immediate social consequences of his view, and what he says is not nearly so far from what she dubs social Darwinism, as she might like. See page six of her book, for example, where she describes the view that life has been scientifically proved to be essentially competitive, an individual law showing such things as cooperation, love and altruism to be unreal, as nonsense. Actually, over this, Darwin did acknowledge considerable difficulty, what she calls nonsense, as he wrestled with the implications of his theory for social policy. Wrestled, he certainly did not take the view that life was essentially competitive to be nonsense. The third chapter of Origin is actually entitled Struggle for Existence, and in it he tells us that every organic being, and of course we're organic beings, is striving to the utmost to increase in numbers, that each lives by a struggle at some period of its life, and that heavy destruction inevitably falls on either young or old during each generation or at current intervals. 
And he rounds off this bleak picture with a strange and unsettling image. This is from Origin, chapter 3. The face of nature, he says, may be compared to a yielding surface with 10,000 sharp wedges packed close together and driven by incessant blows, sometimes one wedge being struck and then another with greater force. It's noteworthy that in his own pre-publication notebook, the phrase, by incessant force, is followed by talk of the blows being accompanied by a forcing out of others. Maybe he thought this thought too brutal for the general public, but it's certainly consistent with the general drift of chapter 3 and indeed of Origen as a whole. Nor in Origen did he reject all or any form of progressive interpretation as we have seen. Moving away from nature as a whole, what he did think, alarmingly perhaps to us today, was that there were tendencies in his own society, that is Victorian England, England, which if unchecked would impede progress. And these tendencies were precisely the ones of love, cooperation, compassion and altruism which characterised contemporary Christian morality, that espoused by Bishop Sam Wilberforce, the supposed loser in the Oxford Union debate. And it's worth just mentioning here, if you don't know, that Wilberforce was, of course, related to William Wilberforce, the emancipator of the slaves. Um, And that was part of his animus against um, Darwin. It's interesting that T.H. Huxley, Darwin's bulldog in the debate, rejected what what came to be known as social Darwinism, arguing that in civilized society, altruistic values come into play, replacing the unbridled competition of the survival of the fittest. The problem is how to make this no doubt admirable view consistent with Darwin's own theory, a point which ultimately led Alfred Russell Wallace, a um, co-expounder of the theory, to postulate divine intervention in the formation of human nature, making humanity discontinuous from the animals to which evolution and natural selection applied. I can't say more about that now, but it's an interesting story. The first uncomfortable aspect of Darwin's thinking about human nature is its unqualified progressivism, which is something actually present in his thinking ever since his encounter with the Tierra del Fuegians on the Beagle voyage as early as 1832. He wrote then that the difference between savage and civilised man was greater than that between wild and domesticated animals, inasmuch as in man there is a greater power of improvement. By the time he came to write The Descent of Man in 1871, this view had hardened. They, that is the poor Diego del Fuegians, they possessed hardly any arts and, like wild animals, lived on what they could catch. They had no government and were merciless to everyone not of their tribe. Darwin goes on to avert that he would rather be descended from a monkey or baboon who manifested traits of loyalty and self-sacrifice as from, quote, a savage who delights to torture his enemies, offers up bloody sacrifices, practices infanticide without remorse, treats his wives like slaves, knows no decency, and is haunted by the grossest superstitions. That's in The Descent of Man. Darwin also, unfortunately, spends a whole chapter in Descent explaining how inferior races have been supplanted by superior ones and even at the present day civilised nations are everywhere supplanting barbarous ones. He explains this not by reference to guns as, but as being due to the working out through natural selection of the be- effects of better intellectual and moral faculties and sensibilities. Though quite how moral sensibilities are supposed to help is unclear given that their development may well lead to decadence and decline, as we will see. And he also points out that human development is not from a basic level from which some races declined, but rather an ascent from lower forms of humanity, which are progressively supplanted by higher forms. I say again, he doesn't mention in this supplantation the rifle. That his Victorian contemporaries might not be taking sufficient care in this area worries him. In Descent, he notices a tendency for the unfit, this is in our own society, 
the inferior in body and mind, even the abject poor to breed. If mankind is to advance, we must uncover the laws of inheritance and then legislate against marriages among the biologically inferior. We must not encourage the poor to marry because abject poverty tends to its own increase by leading to recklessness in marriage. To counterbalance this, we have to encourage the prudent and the able to rear the largest number of offspring. Man, he says, like every other anim animal, has no doubt advanced to his present high condition through a struggle for existence consequent on his rapid multiplication. If it is to advance further, it is to be feared he must remain subject to a severe struggle. Oops. Above all, we must ensure that the struggle for existence is not suffered in its severity by, quote, again, well-intentioned laws and customs. There must continue to be open competition for all men, otherwise mankind would sink into indolence and the more gifted men would not be more successful in the battle of life than the less gifted. Now, all those quotations are very easy to find. They're all in the general summary from The Descent of Man, Volume 2, at the end. Now, Mary Midgley inveighs against what she calls the egoistic myth of universal cutthroat competition and against an unrealistic acceptance, as she puts it, of competitiveness as central to human nature. Indeed, much of her animus against the Omega men and indeed against social contract theories such as Hobbes seem, is against their advocacy of individualism and free market competitiveness. No doubt there are all sorts of objections to such views, which do in fact allow for a degree of cooperation where that enhances mutual survival. Once again, much more could be said here, but in the light of the passages from dissent I've just quoted, that a stress on the necessity of a competition is in tension with Darwinian biology is not one of them. While we, and Mary Midgley, might like an emphasis on social instincts as a counter to pure individualism, what is not immediately clear is how that emphasis can be squared with the competitive spirit required by natural selection. Darwin does try in, in dissent. He says, it must not be forgotten that although a high standard of morality gives but a slight or no advantage to each individual man and his children over the other men of the same tribe, yet then an increase in the number of well-endowed men and an advancement in the standard of morality will certainly give an immense advantage to one tribe over another. A tribe including many members who from possessing in a high degree the spirit of patriotism, fidelity, obedience, courage and sympathy were always ready to aid one another and to sacrifice themselves for the common good would, he says, be victorious over most other tribes and this would be natural selection. That's Darwin. These are noble sentiments but hardly enough to show that in a tribe whose members were always ready to sacrifice themselves for the common good, would avoid the decline into indolence Darwin fears in the absence of a strong competitive spirit. Even if there are examples of successful tribes operating as Darwin describes, he would still have to show that it was precisely their moral traits that enable them to prevail in the cauldron of natural selection. There is, there is inevitably a degree of wishful thinking in Darwin's position here. Of that, Mary Midgley cannot be accused. She does not attempt to justify her humanitarianism on its success in getting a society to flourish under constraints of natural selection. Her starting point is quite different, emphasising the reliance of both human beings and other animals on wider and deeper holes in which they live and move and have their being. Social psychologists, she says, have drawn attention to the complex dependence of human in individuals on their background. Yeah. Ethologists have shown from animal parallels, animal parallels how deep the function of this is likely to be. And from this perspective, she rejects egoism, social contract theory and, unbr and unbridled capitalism and any interpretation of evolution which might seem to support any of this. What we are primarily up against, she says, is a chaotic mob of dollar-snatching cormorants doing damage of an order undreamt of in previous ages. Unfortunately, 
With the rise of scientific materialism, enlightenment rationalism and individualism, economic and philosophical, she thinks, we have lost a grip on much of the traditional, often religious morality, which might once have been a bulwark against all of this. According to Midgley, perhaps echoing trends in the thinking of Elizabeth Anscombe about the conceptual mess current moral philosophy languishes in, and anticipating Philip of Foot about something called natural goodness inherent in human nature, allowing us to rise above the constrictions of utilitarian and Kantian ethical frameworks, what we need to do is to get beyond the standard philosophical talk of rights, justice and individualism and the scientific reductionism which often supports such thinking and attempt to build or rebuild a system which replaces destructiveness, moral and ecological, with a sense of multiple duties we owe, not just to each other, but to the natural world in which we, lo- we, live. we live. We are to see ourselves as playing, in her words, a tiny part in a vast, irreplaceable and fragile whole. This might seem to bring us back to an evolutionary perspective, and true enough, it does, but it is not the perspective of the evolution of Darwin and his followers, which emphasises competition and struggle. For all the purple prose at the end of Origin, as early as 1856, in a letter, Darwin is writing of the clumsy, wasteful, blundering, low and horribly cruel works of nature. In Origin, he famously writes of the waste, profligacy and cruelty in nature, bees being killed by their own stings, drones being produced for the performance of just one act, then to be slaughtered, ignumonidae feeding on the bodies of live caterpillars. He says, the wonder indeed is, on the theory of natural selection, that more cases of the want of absolute perfection have not been observed. In 1865, in a letter to Hooker, there is an even more downbeat reflection on the certainty of the extinction of all life. To think, he says, of millions of years, with every continent swarming with good and enlightened men, presumably all the savages having been eliminated by the rifle, all ending in this, and probably with no fresh start until our planetary system has been again converted into a red-hot gas. Sit transit gloria mundi with a vengeance. Thus vanishes the glory of the world. Were the upbeat reflections about a grandeur in this view of life put in to hearten his audience to the bleakness of the message, which surely is there beneath the surface at least, or were they an attempt to boost his own morale and that of his family? However we might interpret Darwin's own attitude to these matters, his followers have shown no such ambiguity. Typical and effectively criticised by Midgley in in Evolution as a Religion is Jack Monod in the best-selling Chance and Necessity. In the evolutionary popular science stakes a noted precursor to Dawkins. In a melodramatic effort to establish the rigour of his scientific atheism and the absolute meaninglessness of life and existence in a universe which cares nothing for us, Mono writes that, quote, the universe was not pregnant with life nor the biosphere with man. I mean, they're all existentialists, these people, and they like all this (coughs) self-dramatisation. We human beings are here by chance, in a universe which is not responsive to us at all and within which our existence has no significance. Mankind is a gypsy living in an alien world which is deaf to his music. That's all mono. Without entering into debates about fine-tuning and the anthropic principle, one could point out that given that life has emerged, there must be a sense in which the universe was pregnant with life and, the, and indeed the biosphere with humanity. Life and ourselves could not have come from nowhere. Our existence must in some rudimentary way have been present in the universe before we existed. Equally, Mono is silent on the way that this alien world seems to have allowed for the appearance of gypsies, that is us, who are able to perceive it and find value in it. Midgley takes Mono to task for overplaying the chance aspects of evolution and denying that evolution is continuous with and at home in the surrounding world, a position which he calls animism. 
What Mary is urging against her evolutionary opponents is a view of nature and of life itself, which could be called holistic. The tendency of reductive physicalism and of those interpretations of evolution which she rejects is to see the world in terms of individuals, atoms, genes, or whatever, all individually the source of their activity and also of the activity of the larger beings which they compose, biological organisms in the evolutionary sense, that's a selfish gene, of course. Against this, as we have seen, Midgley will urge a far more holistic picture in which individuals are rooted in nature and in a wider society, and in which genes function in complexes without their activity being predetermined in isolation. To use a more modern term, which I think actually she did use later on, one of her targets here will be genocentrism. It isn't the genes running the show, but the whole organism in which genes are component parts whose operation is partly moulded top-down by the organism itself. And of course, she will also look at biological organisms in their natural environment as part of that environment, affecting and being affected by it. Furthermore, she rails, especially in what is philosophy for, against the tendency of contemporary philosophers and scientists to see the problems of life and consciousness being to show how brute matter could come alive or, quote, mere meat, the brain, could come to be aware. The cells and matter of our bodies are alive and our brains are not mere meat, but organised in such a way as to live, as to think. And such organisation must have been there in embryonic form, at least, before life, before consciousness. One of the points which Midgley makes about Mono and the scientific atheists is that their dramatically bleak view is not actually required by science. Questions about the ultimate meaning of reality are not scientific ones. She says, a hunger, this is in evolution as a religion, a hunger for meaning is central to our lives. To keep this wider impulse out of factual investigations is not just emotionally difficult, it is conceptually impossible, she says. We have to connect things up into world pictures and the task is to choose between bad and good world pictures. Obviously the type of evolutionary thinking and the associated individualism she has been criticising is for her a bad world picture for the reasons she has given. So what does she propose? beyond the type of holistic thinking we've been examining already. She tells us that she is not religious in a formal or dogmatic sense. However, she says, I am struck by the strong intellectual need there is to have some view of the cosmos as a whole. It does seem to me that the project of entirely depersonalizing this view may not be a possible one. Possibly for human beings, the only alternative to thinking of the universe as in some vast and remote way, purposive and benign, is to think of it as purposive and radically malignant. It may simply not be within our capacity, except, of course, by just avoiding thought, which is what she thinks, what do these scientistic people do, avoid thought. It may simply not be within our capacity to think of it as having no sort of purpose or direction, whatever. And since the notion that it is rad radically malignant is a crazy one, benignity seems to me the only usable option. Earlier, she had written a William James's view of a religious view being one directed to the world as a whole, about which there is something solemn, serious, and tender. That's William James. It must also be an attitude of enthusiastic rather than grudging acceptance, resting on a belief that there is an unseen order involving absolute surrender to that larger power. This, according to James and Midgley, intellectual fashion, but it's intellectual fashion, has been against for more than two centuries. I think that Mary Midgley's view here, like James's, would be that there is enough in human life and experience to support such a view, even against the tough-minded critics who would dismiss it. It would certainly be wrong simply to dismiss it. Cosmic benignity, 
a sense of power, solemn, serious and tender. Not very Darwinian, one might think, and certainly not scientific. The significance of Mary Midgley's book is not the detail of her interpretation of Darwin himself, but the masterly way she has analysed and shredded a set of popular beliefs which their proponents like to present as scientific, but which are not actually demanded by science, which are not actually scientific, and in their totalising tendency share many of the characteristics of the traditional religious views they have replaced in popular culture. This is what Midgley calls evolution as a religion, the thing she's arguing against, and she gives us plenty of reasons for questioning it and its overweening pretensions. She is against evolution as a religion, but in her crusade against the neo-Darwinians and the sociobiologists and the Omega men, she is encouraging us to entertain a religious view of her own. 